forum. Um, without any further ado, I will introduce our speaker tonight, who many of you already know. She is Sharon McGee, who is a current board member and past president of Washington Crossing Audubon. She has just recently returned from a month in Colombia. That's a country which has more species of birds than any other country on earth. It's a birder's paradise. And many of those species are endemic. They're only found in Colombia, and in some cases only found in very small areas of Colombia, very specific habitats, which um, Sharon will be talking about tonight. Uh, I hope you enjoy tonight's talk, and I hope you're also inspired to do a little avatourism of your own on your next vacation. Another thing that Sharon will talk about is how important that kind of avatourism or ecotourism is to habitat preservations in some of the poor com countries like Colombia. It can help them um, preserve their own forests, which most of them want to do, while still being able to survive and make some money. And uh, that is good for us as who are birders and us as tourists, them as uh, people, small farmers, etc., who are living in these countries and want to continue to be able to survive in their own country and also good for the planet as a whole. So, uh, Sharon, I will now turn the virtual platform over to you. Thank you, Anita. Uh, Birds of Columbia. Columbia's complex topography results in the highest biodiversity in the world, ranked by the highest rate of species in areas and the largest number of endemic species. Columbia ranks first in the number of bird species with over 1,900 bird species, 18% of the world's total. Columbia is second in overall biodiversity, ranked by greatest number of species. Southeastern Colombia is part of South America's Amazonian basin. The Rio Valpes is a tributary of the Rio Negro. The Rio Valpes is nutrient poor because of surrounding white sands, ancient soils with few nutrients, support in stunted forests compared to the nutrient rich younger soils, which support lush tropical forest. Although the state capital of Mitu is growing, Large areas of rainforest remain in the Colombian Amazon. This view is from the indigenous community of Urania on the Rio Valpes near Mitu. With their permission, we are standing on their sacred rock overlooking their land. Globally, 50% of remaining undeveloped lands and 80% of remaining high quality habitat are indigenous lands. The indigenous peoples are our best allies in preserving the remaining rainforest and its biodiversity. These indigenous communities are beset by land hungry settlers, illegal loggers, and illegal miners, all wanting indigenous lands. Ecotourism is an important component of helping indigenous people keep their land and provides badly needed funds for the communities. There are bird species that are specialists of flooded forest or in terra firma, unflooded forest. Within the terra firma, there are white sand specialists. Within each forest type, birds may specialize in the level of the forest they prefer. From the forest floor to the canopy, all these factors add to the diversity of Amazonian bird species. Sampling of Amazonian birds clockwise from the upper left. Fari topaz, a lowland riparian hummingbird. Lineated woodpecker, widespread in forested habitats in the neotropics, but avoiding the interior lowland forest. Yellow green grosbeak, a bird of lowland humid forest and forest borders. Great jacamar, bird of the canopy of humid lowland forest. Purple tuff, a katinga, preferring the canopy and borders of lowland humid forest. Green or a pendola confined to tall humid forest in the Amazon basin and white fronted dunbird, Amazonian subspecies found in terra firma forest. From left to right, cherries ant wren, fasciated ant shrike, and chestnut crested ant bird. The ant wren and ant bird are white sands forest specialists. 
The antrike habitat is vine tangles in dense mid-story lowland evergreen forests. Ant birds are a species of a rich species rich family of sub scenes confined to the American tropics, reaching their greatest diversity in the Amazonian lowlands with 60% of the species found there. Antrans, ant shrikes, and ant birds and other groups of the family differ in bill size and shape. Most ant birds are secretive birds of the forest understory, best located by their sounds. Ant birds were named because early explorers thought they ate ants. The ant birds that follow ant swarms actually eat the creatures fleeing the ants. Most ant birds do not even follow the swarms. Many species are found in mixed feeding flocks. Populations of ant birds that inhabit the mid-story are stable, but ground-feeded ant birds are significantly declining in numbers. Pesticide-laden soil blown by storms from sub-Saharan Africa is the probable cause of this decline. The world is connected even in remote areas. Flycatchers are the largest family of birds found in Colombia, found in all types of habitats and at all altitudes. Tyrant flycatchers are a large, diverse, mainly neotropical family of subocenes. Clockwise from left, Rufus crowned Alania, drab water tyrant, yellow browed toady flycatcher, and yellow throated flycatcher. The Alania prefers white sand woodland habitat. The water tyrant favors large rivers. The toady flycatcher likes the canopy of humid lowland forests. And the flycatcher is widespread generalist found primarily in the canopy and borders of wet and humid forests in the lowlands. From the left, dusky cat flycatcher, Amazonian subspecies, forest Elenia, and streaked flycatcher both with populations in the lowlands of Amazonia and the northern Colombian lowlands. The Amazonian dusty cat flycatcher subspecies has less yellow and may be a cryptic species. It is important to establish species versus subspecies because much conservation funding is at the species level only. A subspecies that is in trouble is too easily overlooked and has little protection. Colombian Amazonian birds are poorly studied due to accessibility issues and a prior history of violence in the area. Much remains to be learned and ecotourists can contribute by adding eBird records. Our group documented 12 species that were not either on IcoTerra or eBird list or probable species in the area. Left, Turquoise Tanninger fairly common in the canopy of human Amazonian lowland forest and mostly terra firma accompanying mixed canopy flocks. Genus Tangera is the most diverse genus in Colombia with 33 species. Tangera tanningers are known for their bright colors. Right, silver beak tanninger, a bird of eastern lowlands to the lower subtropics. The yellow tufted woodpecker is a common and conspicuous woodpecker of the Amazon region. Confined in the Neotropics, mannequins are small, predominantly fruit eaters, most diverse in the lowland forest. Rare and local, the yellow crowned mannequin generally prefers scrubby, sandy belt woodland at the borders of streams and oxbow lakes, as well as seasonally flooded, stunted forest. Unlike most mannequin species, the male defends the territory and is not known to form lex. Lex are where male cotingids and other birds gather, multiple males will display in the same area. Common east of the Andes, the cobalt winged parakeet is found in humid forests and other semi-wooded areas of the lower tropical zone. Parrots are hard to find. They're often heard flying high overhead. But if you can find a fruit and tree, you sometimes get lucky and actually are able to photograph them. One of the most spectacular Andean birds, the Ghanaian cock of the rock is found in the white sands belt of the terra firma forest in Eastern Colombia, preferring areas near stony outcrops 
where the males form leks where they're most easily seen. Imagine six of these birds together. The fruit eating contingas and neotropical family are important seed dispersers in the tropical forest. From the left, a roadside hawk, most common raptor in Colombia, ornate hawk eagle found in lowland and foothill humid forests. Like many Colombian raptors, the hawk eagle is found in low density over a large area. Because it is uncommon to rare, large forest raptor with low productivity at most one year, one young every two years, and has a dependence on extensive tracts of forest, this species is listed as near threatened. Declines in local extirpations have been noted in many areas and continued trends of development and forest clearing ensure that the global population will continue to decline. The dry Northeast is a mixture of dry forest or scrub, savanna disturbed lands and mangroves. Left the russet-throated puffbird found in semi-dry woodland and scrubby habitats. And on the right, there are a knock and solitator found in drier woodland and thorny scrubs. Puffbirds are an exclusively neotropical family. Puffbirds eat large and frequent meals and spend most of their time sitting motionless as this bird was doing, making them a favorite of photographers in the neotropics. Saltators are large, thick-set tanager relatives with almost cardinal-like beaks. Many spirit species prefer semi-open areas. Spot-bedded woodpecker is found in semi-open areas below 5,000 feet. While the family originated in Africa, woodpeckers reach their highest diversity in the Neotropics. There are 45 species in Colombia alone. Black-chested jay is found in a variety of forest types, wet and dry up to 6,800 feet. Jays are the only South American corvids reaching their highest diversity in the Neotropics. Bicolored wrens are birds of scattered brushland of various nature. In Columbia, four races use a variety of habitats, including arid thorn scrub with cacti. Wrens reach their highest diversity in the Neotropics. 34 wren species are found in Columbia. Big billed euphonia, northern subspecies shown here, is common in the North and Andean valleys occurring in a wide variety of partially open habitats, rarely above 3,600 feet. The Amazonian subspecies occurs in floodplain forest. Three breeding populations are divided by high mountains. This is a good candidate to be split. The Northwestern Andes shown on the left has the highest level of bird speciation in the world. With three branches of the Andes, so the Eastern, Central, and Western, divided by the Rio Magdalena and Rio Caca rivers, Colombia has a complex topography, which has allowed geographic isolation of populations leading to speciation. There's also speciation track and vegetation changes with altitude. Altitude gradations will be the tropics, sea level to 650 feet, foothills, 600, 1,600, 500 to 4,000 feet, subtropics, 4,000 to 660 feet, temperate zones, 6,060 feet to tree line, which is approximately 10,725 feet, Paramo, tree line to snow line. These factors result in the world's richest avifauna. The right hand map shows our itinerary, except for this place, which we were unable to, uh, to get to. Cacaguan is a Colombian endemic now confined to the subtropical dry forest of the Caca Valley. All members of the Crassidae family, guans, chacalacas, and curacaos, have been heavily hunted. And as a result, the larger species have severely depleted populations, hence the endangered status. 
The Kaka Valley has been heavily deforested for agriculture. The blue bill carousel male is on the left, the female on the right. A large bird restricted to remnant human undisturbed forest up to the foothills and on lower mountain slopes in northern Colombia. The bluebell carousel is critically endangered due to deforestation and hunting pressure. Ecotourism supports the pro aves preserve that protects this species. Pro aves and the American Bird Conservancy brought the preserve, but money from ecotourism is critical for hiring guards and rangers to prevent illegal logging and poaching both which are a threat to this bird. This orange wing parrot lives on the bluebill carousel preserve. It was taken from the nest young, but rescued from a nearby village where it was being kept as a cage bird with four others of its kind. The birds were released on the preserve. The other four were taken at night by tyras, large weasels. You can see one on the left. This individual parrot is now caged at night, but freely roams the preserve during the day. This is known as a soft release. Parrots that are taken from the wild when young do not learn the culture of their species and are too naive to survive in the wild. This parrot now has a good life, but it will never be part of a breeding population. Poaching for the cage bird trade is a major problem in the neotropics. Poaching and habitat loss combined to make parrots one of the most endangered avian families worldwide. With 164 species, the most of any country, hummingbirds are one of the most diverse groups in Colombia. Occurring in all habitats, hummingbirds reach their greatest diversity in the lower subtropical humid forest and forest edge. Left to right, Andean emerald, foothills and subtropics, black tail train bear, arid highlands, blowing puff lake, temperate Andean forest. Left to right, bronzy Inca, montane forest throughout the Andes, buff tail coronet, subtropical and lower temperate forest in all three Andean ranges. Collared Inca, upper subtropical and temperate forest to Parama. Clockwise from upper left. Purple threaded wood star, subtropical forest of the western slope in north central Andes. Purple bib white tip, foothills and subtropical forest on the Pacific slope of the western Andes. Long tailed silk forest edge and open wooded Andes and speckled hummingbird subtropical and temperate forest. Clockwise from upper left, sparkling violet ear abundant in montane forest and edge. Velvet purple coronet, a near endemic in the upper foothill and subtropical forest and edge on the Pacific slope of the Western Andes. Green hermit, foothills and subtropicals of all three Andean ranges. Tourmaline Sun Angel, subtropical and temperate forest throughout the Andes. Um, Pygmy owls are an example of altitudinal speciation. The cloud forest pygmy owl is a near endemic found in subtropical forest edges below the Andean, but above the Central American pygmy owls. The species is little known and there's no data on the population level. Continuing forest destruction and degradation is a major threat. Most of Western Ecuador, including the species type locality, that's where it was first described, is completely deforested. Major road construction in Western Colombia is providing access to the once remote areas that were the remaining stronghold of the species and resulting in a similar degree of deforestation. From left, crimson mantle woodpecker found in subtropical and temperate forest and edge, and acorn woodpecker found in oak forest in the Andes. If you look at the map, you can see the uh, acorn woodpecker has a huge range, but then there's a big gap, and 
isolated populations in the Indian region. This has to be a different species uh, from our northern one. But more study is needed. Trogons are birds of the humid forest. At least one species is found in most forest types in Colombia. Left to right, white-tailed trogon male and female found in Pacific lowlands and foothills across the northern Andes and into the Magellana Valley. And mass trogon female found in subtropical and temperate forest and forest edge. Note that the tail pattern differs sexually within the species, but also between the species. A uh, tail pattern is a good indication of um, species, a good field mark. Motmots are a neotropical family of forest and forest edge birds. Part of the blue crown motmot complex, the ending motmot occurs at higher levels than other motmots. The red-headed barbet is common in the humid forest and forest edge of all three Indian cordilleras. The male is on the left, the female on the right. Barbets are mostly fruit eaters of the forest canopy, but this couple came down to a fruit feeder at an echo lodge. Neotropical barbets are now separated from the Asian and African barbets and placed in a family of their own. Mountain toucans are toucans of the highlands. black Bell mountain toucan, a near endemic highland toucan, is found in subtropical and lower temperate forest. The chestnut crown ant pitta has a broad altitudinal range in montane, that is mountain forest and woodland undergrowth. Local differences in subspecies may indicate more than one species. Ant pittas are plump, almost tiefless birds of the dark undergrowth. They are shy and difficult to see, but some species will come to worm feeding stations where this individual was photographed. Some of the parks now have um, worm feeding stations to promote ecotourism. Pyrenids, oven birds are a large diverse group of sub scenes endemic to Central and South America. Wood creepers are scansorial birds adapted to forage on trees. Note the similar shape of all the wood creepers and the woodpecker-like tails they all have. From the left, brown wood creeper, a foothill subspecies shown, strong-billed wood creeper, human montane forest subspecies, montane wood creeper found in subtropical and temperate forest and edge, and finally, streaked wood creeper found in northern and western forests below 5,000 feet. The first two species have distinctive lowland subspecies that may be split from the Andean subspecies. There are 32 species in 15 genera. The flammulated tree hunter, an oven bird found in human montane forests in the Andes and Santa Marta range. It has an affinity for bamboo thickets. From the left, white throated triangulate, common in montane temperate forest in Paramo. Cinnamon flycatcher, common in Indian cloud forest edges and clearings. Um, the Cinnamon flycatcher is a good indication of feeding flocks nearby. The guides always get very excited when they hear one because they know there's a feeding flock in the vicinity. Wrens reach their greatest diversity in the neotropics from left, speckled breasted wren, local and common in the central valleys. Apollinaris wren, an endangered endemic found around reed beds in the eastern Cordillera, and the Munchik wood wren, a critically endangered endemic of the western Andes. Apollinaris wren is highly restricted both in range and habitat. 
It is threatened by continuing habitat loss as the reed beds around Bogota are drained for development and also by shiny cowbird parasitism. The Munchik wood wren is considered to be critically endangered because of its small population size, extremely restricted range, and threats from deforestation and climate change. From the left, flame rump tanager, male and female, Western Andes and Kaka Valley, lemon runt tanager, male and female, Central Cordillera. Originally considered subspecies of the flame rump tanager and now considered two species. Intermediates do occur where they're brought together by deforestation. From the left, mask flower piercer, subtropical forest and edge throughout the Andes. Blue gray tanager, Andean subspecies. Purple mantle tanager, Pacific slopes of the Western Andes and North Central Andes. Clockwise from left, blue neck tanager found in Indian foothills and subtropical forest. Silver throated tanager found in canopy in western and north central Andes. And the golden tanager found throughout the Andes. Most finches are sparrows found in two genera. From the left, gray brow brush finch found in temperate forest throughout the Andes. Lady brush finch found in temperate forests and piranha throughout the Andes, and pale naked brush finch, temperate zone in piranha of central and eastern Andes. A very special bird, Antiochia brush finch, was first described in 2008 for museum specimens collected in 1971 and was presumed to be extinct, but was rediscovered by Rudolfo Correa on January 7th, 2018. It is confined to the temperate zone of the northern tip of the central Andes. An American Bird Conservancy sponsored survey found 19 individuals. Another survey by a group of birders found 24. This is one of the rarest birds in the world. I am standing with Rudolfo on the road to his family land where he rediscovered the brush finch. Behind this is a mosaic of pasture and remnant brush land characteristic of the habitat where the brush finch was found. The area has been cattle ranches for centuries. Clearing the brush behind this would allow the rancher to support one more cow. However, pasture adjacent to remnant brush land retains more moisture so the milk yield per cow is higher in the mosaic of pasture and brushland shown here, as Rudolfo's family has maintained. Rudolfo and his friends have been approaching local ranchers to persuade them it is in, to their advantage to retain a mosaic of pasture and brushland, and in doing so are preserving habitat for this critically endangered species. The red-bellied brackle is an endemic species found in chlorid for forest in northern, central, and western Andes in the upper Magellina Valley. Magellina Valley has been heavily deforested since the steamboat era, when the forest 150 kilometers on each side of the river were felled to keep the steamboats going. The grackle is a rare and local restricted range species. Its main threat is deforestation for agriculture, cattle production, timber, and mining. The grackle has lost 64% of its original habitat, with a 7 to 8% reduction in the decade 2000-2010 alone. Capture for the cage bird trade is also a problem. Clockwise from upper left, tropical perula, humid forests in the north and west up to the temperate zone. Blackburnian warbler, boreal migrant in montane forests up to the temperate zone. Bay-breasted warbler, boreal migrant found up to the foothill forests in the north and west. 
Rufus Cat Warbler found up to the subtropics in the north and in the Mediterranean Valley. 34 species of boreal breeding warblers have been reported on the Colombian mainland. Deforestation for sun grown coffee and cocaine is a major factor in the decline of Blackburnian, Canada, Cerulean, and Golden Wing warblers among the fastest declining warbler species. The Pro AV Cerulean Warbler Preserve was founded to preserve winter and habitat for the rapidly declining cerulean warblers. We saw 14 warblers in two and a half days, including the boreal migrants, cerulean, black and white, Tennessee morning, black burning and bay breasted and Canada warblers and American red star. And the neotropical, tropical perula, rufous cat warbler, three striped warbler and slate throated white star. Both primary forest and traditional shade grown coffee plantations supported healthy warbler populations. Unfortunately, we drove through miles and miles of sterile sun-grown coffee plantations to reach the preserve. The one thing everyone can do to help these birds and to help the deforestation is to not drink sun-grown coffee, but to only drink certified shade-grown coffee. Left, the golden fronted white start, sometimes called the golden fronted red start in older books, is a near endemic of the Indian temperate forest. Belonging to a neotropical genus, the three stripe warbler is common in the foothills and subtropics of the Andes. Even for these relatively secure species, the population estimate is unknown. More records are needed to accurately assess the conservation status of these birds. Ecotourists can help, much needs to be learned. The Paramo is a high elevation plant zone above the tree line and below the snow line. And yes, we are in the clouds. Left, chestnut wings and clodies, south central Andes, and stout fields and clodies, southern Andes. Oven birds of the high Paramo. Chestnut wings and clodies has been recently split from the bar wings and clodies species group on a combination of genetic, vocal, plumage, and behavioral data. Many striped Casanero is an oven bird of the shrubby Paramo. Suitable habitat is generally limited in aerial extent. It is thought to be highly susceptible to overgrazing, but benefits from occasional burning of the Paramo. From the left, ground back chat tyrant found in temperate shrub and brushy parama. Red rubbed bush tyrant found in open grassy highlands. The distinctive red rubbed bush tyrant has been recently placed in its own genus. Note on the maps, Eber took over Birds of the World from BirdLife International. The original maps, as shown on the right, are from the Lynx edition Handbook Birds of the World. Maps are being updated. Some species are only available in eBird format. Others are only available. Well, it, it, it's, a, it's a mess. Hope, hopefully in a couple of years, uh, eBird will get everything uh, straight and out and do, do down to one consistent system. Helmet crests are a robust hummingbird genus endemic to the high paramos of Colombia. The buffy helmet Crest has very restricted distribution in the high central Andes of Colombia. Helmet crests are associated with flowering shrubs in the genus Espelitia, shown flowering here. The buffy helmet crest is a restricted range species with a patchy distribution even in suitable habitat. Where there's a difference in IUCN red list and Colombian status, the IUCN status is lifted first. And for this bird, if you're not familiar with um, that, the SNE, it means it needs more study. They don't have enough information. Uh, the Colombians, however, consider this bird in danger. From the left, shining sunbeams found in high elevation temperate forest edge in Parama and rain beer bearded thornbill found in shrubby Parama 
stunted woodlands, and rocky slopes below the actual Prama. Shining sunbeams are altitudinal migrants descending seasonally to lower elevations. The thornbill is uncommon through most of its range and is declining. High elevation hummingbirds go into torpor at night to survive the cold temperatures of the Parana. Mountain tanagers are among the most colorful tanagers in the Andes. The Scarlet Valley mountain tanager is found from high montane forest to Parama. The Santa Marta Mountains have been identified as the planet's most important and irreplaceable site for threatened and endemic biodiversity by numerous scientific publications and every major international conservation organization. The range is home to over 600 bird species. It's also home to Pro AV Signature Preserve. The Santa Marta Range is the most important area for endemicism in Colombia with 25 country endemics. You can see the ruggedness of the terrain in this um, slide. The Santa Marta screech owl is found in subtropical forest and edge of the Santa Marta Range. The Santa Marta parakeet is an endangered endemic in subtropical forest and edge on northern slopes of Santa Marta Mountains. The parakeet is listed as endangered because of its restricted geographical distribution in a region that is under pressure of habitat loss from expansion of agriculture. Santa Marta brush finch, an endemic found in the forest edge, is qualitatively assessed to be common to very common in its limited range, but there's no quantitative population data across the whole range, and the species is not being monitored. The brush finch is the easiest Santa Marta endemic to find. Santa Marta warbler is an endemic found in bamboo and temperate forest understory. The warbler's distribution is fragmented, as the map shows, and its range decreasing due to deforestation. More than one fifth of montane forest is already lost, and most of the original vegetation has been greatly modified by various illegal activities such as agricultural expansion, logging, and burning. The white lord warbler is a Santa Marta endemic found in the foothill and subtropical forest on the slopes of the Santa Marta range. It is listed because of ongoing deforestation for agricultural conversion within its range. From the left, Santa Marta subspecies of blue nick chlorophonia and Santa Marta subspecies of they had tanager. The chlorophonia has an extensive circum Amazonian range. Male shows subtle subspecies differences in plumage. Given the genetic and morphological diversity seen within the bay headed tanager complex, this taxon likely consists of multiple species. Thus, the conservation status may change if reevaluated on the actual evolutionary units within this group. The isolated Santa Marta subspecies may indeed be full species. This illustrates the importance of concise evaluation of taxa to conservation. The range restricted Santa Marta populations may be at risk. Again, Columbia is understudied and much more remains to be done. In Columbia, the group bill toucan, toucanet is found in the foothill and subtropical forests of the Santa Marta and Piriha ranges. Um, the bird also, as you can see the map, extends in Venezuela. It basically goes along the Caribbean coast of northern South America. The white tip quetzal is a near endemic found in the subtropical forest in the Santa Marta range. The white tip quetzal is range restricted, occurring only in the coastal ranges of northern Colombia and northern Venezuela, but is not believed to approach the CITES threshold for vulnerable at this time. The population appears to be stable. This concludes our survey of Colombian birds. 
1,900 plus avian species. I could only show you a few highlights, but I hope I have given you a feel for the richness and complexity of Colombian bird life. Thank you very much for your interest in Colombian birds. And Rudolfo says to say hello from him. Thanks, Sharon. Um, <clears throat> does anyone have any questions? They can put them in the chat or use the Q&A function. Um, you can find down at the bottom of the screen. While you're looking at this, I'll just flash on the screen the map citation. No one wants to look at that okay. period of time. Uh oh, I remember the white tipped quetzal. We saw that too. <laughs> Pretty bird. They're gorgeous. They are. Nothing like a quetzal, too. If you're not already a brooder, the sight of one of those will definitely convert you. <laughs> Maybe convince you to uh, do a little ecotourism. Yes. I mean, just look at this guy, you know, gorgeous. <laughs> and they're all iridescent. They're beautiful. And they have a very interesting habit of, um, of uh, swallowing very large. This is a small beak you can see that they've got. And they can swallow these fairly large avocados, not as large as the ones that we eat here. But they're still pretty big nonetheless, whole and then sit there for a while and digest them and then regurgitate them. And you cannot believe when you see this, I happened to see that one time, I actually was in Costa Rica. You can't believe that their mouth is big enough to hold this, the pit of this avocado, but out it comes and they just go back and get another one. <laughs> They're amazing. Okay, uh, we do have a question from Jamie Whitson. She asked if you traveled with one particular tour company. Yes, I went with um, Rock Jumper. Uh, you really do need to do Columbia with a tour company. While it's safe in many places and becoming safer, there are still areas where you should not uh, try to go. And the tour companies know where you can safely go. I will second that. Um, I was in Columbia uh, in the uh, middle of last summer, a few months before Sharon went. Uh, we also went with a tour company. It was a Carol Birding, I-C-A-R-O. Um, which is a Colombian-based tour company. I would not go to Colombia by myself you, or just wander around. You really need to go with somebody who knows where they're going. Um, you'll also find more birds that way. So I second Sharon's uh, endorsement of going with a tour company. Okay, um, Christine asked uh, if some birds are collected for the locals for pets or for export. Both. Yeah. Um, Parrots are certainly collected for both. Um, the Amazonia parrot that I showed, decided to use to discuss this particular topic, is certainly um, part of the international trade, as well as collected by locals. The songbirds that are cage birds tend to be more collected for locals, although, although there is some international trade. Um, the saddest thing is the only close-ups we saw of the large macaws were chained to the top of a building. I debated whether or not to show that. Um, it just, um, you know, it's, it's a huge, huge problem, through, not, not just in Colombia, but throughout uh, South and Central America. Okay, uh, Joanne Pannoni asks, how, how much does it cost for a tour? Um, realizes that airfare is separate and expensive, but how much does do the tour itself uh, tend to run? Well, it depends on the tour. It varies on which tour you take. I took, figuring it would probably be the only time I'd ever go. I went for the month long tour and that was a little under 10,000, but there are more localized tours that are less than that. But I'd say you'd have to at least spend five or six thousand. And you do want to go to with a reputable tour company because I said it's safe and getting safer. But you really need to go with people uh, who know where you're going. And also Definitely. that the reputable tour companies give money to the indigenous communities. When we went to the indigenous communities around the two, they were paid a fee for us to walk on their land that goes to the community itself. Um, probably some fly-by-night, less expensive companies aren't known for doing that. 
No, you don't want to go with them. <laughs> so so it's very right. important to go to someone who has the local knowledge, knows the local guide, to hire the local guide to go along with your main tour guide, like a rock jumper guide and picked up in various locations. Local guides, often indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And so they're making money. When we stopped and saw a group of children, he said, look what I'm doing, I'm making money. Said, Maybe one of you will be the next generation. So it's very, very important, even though it costs a little bit more to go with the tour companies that are engaging with the local um, indigenous peoples and NGOs and various um, not nonprofits like Pro Avis. It's interesting to note, too, that there are people like uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology, which are sending teams of people in to train local guides to be bird guides. And we ran into um, a, a kid. They had a children's program in, in one of the villages that we visited in Colombia. And he was about 14 years old, and he was astonishingly good already at knowing the names of birds in English and Spanish and some of the Latin names as well. And his ambition, his parents ran an eco-tourism lodge. His ambition was to become a bird guide and he was already well on his way as a young teenager. So this was awesome. So there's a lot of good stuff happening and it all is connected with birding in these countries. So we have to support that, I think, as bird lovers. Um, and, uh, Joanne has a follow-up question. Um, does the State Department have a list of tour companies or how did you choose what particular tour company um, that you, you, you went with? Hey, I went with a company, I had been to other places, mm -hmm. um, notably uh, South Africa and Papua New Guinea, that it's an international tour company. They are very careful where they take you, they take you into areas that are only safe. In fact, we had one small itinerary change because um, they were a little bit worried because of some problems going on with indigenous people and illegal gold miners they just caught on their property. Mm. Um, so it's, you know, I went with Rock Jumpers. I know there are other good tour companies out there. The one Juanita went with. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I don't think the State Department is really into encouraging no. tourism. Yeah. It's, it's not one of their concerns. Right, you might want to talk to some other, in fact, you could even, if you want to send a, a message to us here at contact.wcas at gmail.com, um, a lot of us do ecotourism. We can put you on to some good companies if you're interested in going to Columbia. I'll give you a choice. Okay, uh, Franta asked, what were your target birds? She assumes brush finch. Um, and there were, any, were there any that you did not see? <laughs> really I'm still waiting for the 900 question. more. <laughs> um, I did see finally, which I missed in Franta and my three trips to Ecuador, I finally saw a military macaw. That was my uh, number one bird. Okay. Only at a distance flying over. So the big macaws are very leery of people because they are still hunted and captured for the um, international trade. I was hoping to get a Good picture of one. I have them flying in the distance. So I decided not to use that for the talk. But yeah, there were. There was one parrot I really wanted to see. We got to the place where we've been seen recently. There was one lung palm standing in the middle of a bare field and it didn't come back to it. No, thank you, it said. Not enough protection. <laughs> so, it, you know, deforestation is a problem. Now, I, I didn't see everything I wanted to. Uh, Fred Barazzi has a comment um, uh, about how many rare or how many endemics in Colombia are, are rare species. And it doesn't make sense to him that uh, so many birders drink coffee. Um, and of course, there's also the issue <laughs> oh, of he hasn't had coffee in some of these countries. <laughs> the, the issue of illegal drug uh, use. Um, and so uh, he wants to know what your opinion on spreading the word about uh, against drug use and, and coffee. Um, with respect to the effects that they have on the birds? I have been talking about the coffee problem for years, as those of you have, have heard my some of my previous talks know and you know mentioned it in 
Megan's, I, I'm not a coffee drinker myself, but um, I went with my sister and brother-in-law. My brother-in-law is, you know, the, the I, I guess it's going to have to be a grassroots movement. People convincing their friends to spend a little more money on their coffee and go to the higher priced certified sun-grown coffee. The Smithsonian puts puts out a um, list for this. Uh, education of people uh, beyond the birding community is difficult, even within the birding community, it's sometimes mm -hmm. difficult to get people to pay a little bit more because, um, you know, there's a tremendous environmental cost to sun-grown coffee, but that cost is not reflected in the cost of coffee. And this is perhaps a problem that needs to be addressed on the economic level. I'm not quite sure how to address it. I'm not an economist, but there needs to be some type of tax, maybe environmental tax. We talk about carbon tax. How about a species tax? Yeah, there you go. Even out the cost. So you're seeing the real cost when you buy something as long as these big companies can sell the sun grown coffee at cheap prices because they there's no cost to them to grow it that way, even though they're doing tremendous damage in these countries. And we drove through miles and miles and miles of sun grown coffee, just denuded hillsides. Yeah. I, I guess give talks like this and tell people about it. Mm -hmm. um, as for the cocaine, we had some discussion with some of the people I went with on the trip. That's perhaps not the best thing to get into here because the conclusion the group came to would probably not be very popular here. Yes. I'm not sure if Juanita wants me to get into that. <laughs> well, but, it depends what you're going to say. Well, yeah. Maybe I should. Yes, um, yes, no. our, our professor in our group thought the best solution would be to legalize it in the United States, have it like ABC stores and undercut the price of the illegal product. <laughs> that would, it would work. Course, I mean, it worked in prohibition, you know, after prohibition. And of course, in, in uh, South America, Peru, uh, Peru, Chile in particular, uh, um, and to a lesser extent in Colombia, um, people, the indigenous people have used the coca leaves not which do contain co cocaine but in but it's not the same as when you're taking the pure substance and in, in in peru in particular it's considered to be sacred they're very uh you know they're they make coca tea they drink coca tea they're very they they don't want to let go of that because it's part of their culture um up in the higher altitude you can actually we got some coca tea in um when we were up about above 10,000 feet. Um, there are some little places that sell it. Um, it's not cocaine, but you know, they don't want to ever see cocaine banned in their countries because of this, this almost, in some cases, almost a religious um, um, relationship they have with the coca leaf itself and, and using coca leaf rather than cocaine. Um, so yes, uh, um, the, um, the U.S. market is a huge one for 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 the purified cocaine itself, and we are actually fueling a lot of the drug abuse in the in in the, these South American countries. There's no question about that. Well, we're, so, we're certainly fueling the illegal industry, which yes, is exactly um, contributing to the deforestation in many places yeah. and, uh, and the violence. A lot and of, they're the violence. getting a handle more of a handle on it now, I think. But we we could help them more with that, I think, as a country. And, you know, um, outlawing the plant or the leaf would be wrong because it yeah. is part of their culture. And it's yeah. important really taken in small amounts like chewing on the leaves when you're going into high altitudes, when you're living and working at these altitudes, it physiologically helps your body acclimate. It's only exactly. a problem. And it can make you high. It's a completely different, you know, yeah. physiological it, it, thing that's happening or pharmacological thing that's happening there. So... I mean, it's only a problem places like here where it's, it's refined and used as an illegal right. drug. 
used for entirely different purpose. I don't know if that was actually the answer to the question, but if you want to follow up on that, go right ahead. <laughs> I mean, uh, the questioner uh, here, Fred Verazzi. <laughs> there was another part of the question about endemicism and um, endangered. I, I was only able to touch on a few species to try to keep this to a reasonable length. And I certainly wasn't able to get good fat photographs of all the endemics we saw. Some of them are very shy. But um, it certainly is a problem, especially in the Santa Marta Mountains, where parts of the mountains do have a cocaine problem. So you have the highest level of endemicism in the country next to this illegal agricultural venture. It's, it, it's not a good situation. And it, it's one reason why so many of the uh, Santa Marta endemics are listed. Mm -hmm. And some of them, I think, are probably present only in very small numbers anyway, because they are, um, because they are such habitat specialists. You know, high altitude, certain types of um, forest, etc. They're never going to be. Um, they're never going to have a large number of uh, individuals representing the species, which is all the more reason to leave those areas alone and preserve them. Uh, Rick Kaiser asked, did you study bird vocalizations before you travel? Did I? I didn't a lot this time because of the overwhelming number of species. Uh, I have on some trips with more manageable numbers of species. <laughs> and I had uh, prepared some when we went to Ecuador and a lot of the birds, the more common birds, you know, I, I knew from Ecuador, but it was just an overwhelming number of species this trip. And it turns out that a lot of the vocalizations wouldn't have been any good because a guy kept telling us, that's not what they sound like in Ecuador. This is a different species. So <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and he'd whip out his recorder every time he heard the bird looked like the Ecuadorian bird, but sounded differently. We, we did <laughs> hopefully make some contributions to the science there. Yes. Mm -hmm. share that. No, I, I see another question here from Fred saying, did you get to the dry peninsula east of Santa Marta? Oh, yeah, the Guerrera. Yeah, we almost trapped trapped in because of Venezuelan pro Oh, got trapped, I guess, because of Venezuelan problems. Yeah, they yeah. Uh, that's an interesting area there. Did yeah. you go to the... We got just not too far east, but the area border of it near Santa Marta. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we, we didn't go too far east. Yeah, we, we, we got into that area there. That, that's fascinating. It's, like a, it's completely different. It's dry. There's a lot of desert. Um, um, uh, it's a place where they have these massive mud flats where you can see lots of shorebirds, wading birds, and that sort we of thing. We did get to the edge of that. We, we did spend that. one day on the mud flats. Yeah, um, the mud flats, yeah. And then, uh, then the desert part has uh, some interesting birds too, but it was, that's, that was the really hot part. <laughs> yeah. Really hot. But we went into the um, mud flats of the Rio Magdalena just before mm -hmm. we crossed over into the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. Mm-hmm. Good for Trish. She says she's going to go online and order some shade grown coffee. Excellent. And it's good too. Colombian coffee is very good. Yes, the shade grown coffee is actually better coffee. So I'm not a coffee drinker, but I've heard this from many people. Mm -hmm. Because the berries ripen more slowly in the shade right. grown plantations, they have much more flavor. So you will be rewarded by better coffee. <laughs> yes. You'll be paying a little more, but it'll be better. It's worth it. Guajira, that's the place. Guajira, G-U-A-J-I-R-A. 
we did not get that far. We just got to the border of it. Yeah, that's uh, that's fascinating. Here's another question. Uh, Trish asked if that you had any interesting wildlife encounters, um, <laughs> perhaps other than birds. Um, night monkeys were fun. Mm -hmm. We spotlighted those at the same time we spotlighted the um, Santa Marta owl. Um, the terriers I got a photograph of because they came to um, raid the tender feeding stations. They like bananas as well. I saw some interesting squirrels, um, a few monkeys, but the wildlife in Colombia, the bigger wildlife tends to be very wary of people hmm. because they're still hunted. Did you see any Colombian howlers, Colombian red howler monkeys? Heard them. I guess we got Heard them. Yeah. But not good enough to need to stay looking photograph. You certainly heard them. Yes, so oh yes. <laughs> oh, it's like one more question from Fred. Uh, what is the best Amazon spot in your opinion? Well, in Colombia, there's really only one spot that you have to go around the two because the Colombian Amazon is not as highly developed, which means it's not as highly fragmented as areas. I've never been to the Peruvian or Brazilian Amazon. I have been to the Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, and it just, well, Colombia, there's just one choice. It, uh, you have to fly into or take the boat up from Mantuas, Brazil, to get to Mantu, and there are no roads. There are roads around Mantu itself, but there are no roads through the Colombian Amazon. It's one reason it hasn't been as badly degraded as other parts of the Amazon. So, so really, if you want to specifically do the Colombian Amazon, you really have one choice. Yeah. Um, and if, if you want to go with the guy that we had from Ikaro Birding, he has done backpacking trips with people through that part of the Amazon. Uh, there's no hotels. You're going to be camping out in the jungle, which could be a tremendous adventure. Or if you're like me and are not really all that fond of outdoor um, bathroom facilities, um, you might not be so, no thr so thrilled with it, but it would be a unique experience. You can take day trips from too if you're not that um... yeah or you can just yeah, go full bore on a, um, a jungle camping trip <laughs> real adventure you might discover a new species that way yes that's you that's very that's well that's could in there you very well could because it, it's that you're not going on trails you and you have to have a good guide who's really good with you know navigation <laughs> but it would be very exciting. Um, Fairfax asked, how high up did you go? Uh, assuming she means altitude. Uh, well, when we went up to the Paramo, we went, I'm not sure, I'd have to look at the book, but we, we, were, we were certainly we were over 15,000 feet. feet. Yeah. Maybe 13, 14,000 at the highest yeah, point. About 14, I think it's 14 too, if you, when you get up to that little restaurant and the little thing that's up at the top there. Okay. About yeah. 14,250, 14, I think. And then we kept on walking <laughs> up. <laughs> it's high, but if you, it, it's not bad if you, um, you know, if your tour company gets, lets you get, a, you know, accommodated to the altitude gradually, starting at about 3,500 or 4,000 feet and, and gradually working your way up higher, you're not going to feel too, um, you know, like you can't breathe too much. <laughs> Except we had a guy who would get excited about a bird he heard and run to it. <laughs> <laughs> I would walk behind. <laughs> In keto. Yeah, that's, yeah. You're, what I found was my legs sometimes felt like jelly. I didn't have trouble breathing, but I had trouble like climbing or, you know, after a while your legs just said, nope, not doing this anymore. <laughs> Not enough oxygen delivery here. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. 
Okay. Okay. Well, that was great. If anybody does have any other questions, you can you can uh, certainly give them to us here. Send them to us at contact.wcas at gmail.com, and uh, we'll make sure that Sharon gets them. And um, Oh, a couple of new messages here. Good, I'm glad people see. Yep, thank you, Jim, for putting that into the chat box. And um, I hope um, everyone enjoyed the presentation tonight, and I hope everyone who's a serious birder gets a chance to go to Colombia, the birdiest country in the world. You will really enjoy it. And thank you very much, Sharon, for this presentation tonight. Um, it was excellent, and... Um, I certainly enjoyed the memories <laughs> revisiting that amazing country. Okay, everyone, if there are no more questions, um, I will uh, say good night and thank you for joining us tonight and uh, hope to see you again next month. Good night. Good night.